creative mornings. How are we? Good. Whenever I have an opportunity to speak in front of a group of people, I consider it an honor and a pleasure. So thank you for being here. It's so great to be with you all this morning. Um, as Aaron mentioned, for my doctorate, I am studying the impact of smartphone addiction and emotional intelligence. I work for a local firm called Centauric, based in San Diego, but we do global stuff all over the world. So if you're interested in that, come talk to me afterwards. Um, and as my Aaron mentioned, oh, sorry. As Aaron mentioned, I, I am studying smartphone addiction and emotional intelligence. I am a cyborg psychologist. What that means is I study the impact of technology on the human psyche, how it impacts our human relationships, and ultimately how technology is going to impact the workplace. Interesting stuff, right? Um, in other words, I really want to just be RoboCop. Let's be honest. <laughs> You're like, cyborg psychology? And you might be asking yourself, Danny, how did you get into this field? Um, well, it all started several decades ago when I first heard this sound. You've got mail. By, the, by your reaction, I'd love to hear what words stand out to you. What, what do you think about when you hear that sound? Chaos. Chaos. What else? <laughs> what did, someone said something here? Bold. Bold. Old. Yeah, old school. Some of you might not have ever heard that sound before. <laughs> Let's be honest, right? You're like, wait, what is that sound? I don't even. Google it. Google AOL, right? <laughs> America Online. After I heard that sound, every single time I would hear that sound, it would literally change everything, right? It would change everything. And um, for just a moment, I'm going to ask you to be vulnerable with me. Is that OK? You guys OK? So I'm going to provide a few statements, I'm gonna provide a few statements. And if this statement is true for you, I want you to go ahead and stand, OK? If you're in the back, just go ahead and raise your hand, OK? So first statement, statement number one. My recreational activities are reduced due to smartphone use. Go ahead and stand if that's true for you. You can be honest here. OK, go ahead and sit. Go ahead and sit. Next question. Because of my smartphone, my sleep quality and total sleep time has decreased. <laughs> go ahead and sit. Next question, I feel restless and irritable when my smartphone is unavailable. <laughs> Double stand, thank you. Two more, two more. Because of my smartphone, I spend more money than I intended. <laughs> All right, go ahead and sit. By the way, I'm just going to call out everybody in the back. You're probably standing already for all of these, right? So, all right, last question. I was told more than once that I spend too much time on my smartphone. Go ahead and stand if that's true for you. Thank you. Grab a seat. Thank you. Thank you so much for standing. These five statements come from a self-assessment screening tool called the Smartphone Addiction Inventory. And to be honest, I would have stood or rose my hand for every single one of those statements. So thanks for being vulnerable with us this morning. I appreciate that. Now, as a way of experimenting, I'm going to have you do something for the rest of my talk. I'm going to have you grab your phone, get it out right now. Make sure it's on vibrate or do not disturb. And I want you to place it underneath your seat for the remainder of my talk. I know, I know, I know. Some of you might be feeling like this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just for a few moments. It's just for a few moments. And for the remainder of my talk, I want you to pay attention to every single time you try to reach for your phone, either on your person or on your purse, maybe phantom vibration. You may think someone's messaging you when they're really not. And I want you to pay attention and ask yourself a couple questions. Number one. Am I reaching for it simply out of habit? Number two, 
Am I reaching for it because I'm bored? <laughs> number three, am I reaching for it because I want to take a note? I don't want to forget something. Or number four, am I reaching for it because I'm missing out on something else that's happening that's not here? Okay? Don't worry. If you want my notes and my slides, I'm going to give you an opportunity to get all of my slides afterwards, all the notes, all the links that you can have. So you can, don't worry about that. I want you to be fully present and engaged with us. Now, the smartphone has become one of the most important survival tools of the 21st century, next to our smartphones, uh, next to our wallets and our keys. And some would argue, avocado toast, <laughs> right? And as ironic as this graphic is, doesn't it seem like we're devolving, not evolving sometimes? And if, if, if smartphone technology is supposed to be more productive, be more engaged with people, be faster and have more free time, then why does it seem like sometimes we're moving slower, we're more exhausted and stressed out, we say things on social media we would never say to someone else's face, right? And we feel anxious because of FOMO, the fear of missing out, because we're scrolling through our friends' Instagram feeds. Interesting world we live in, isn't it? You see, technology, unfortunately, is like a double-edged sword. It has both the power to enhance our lives and also to destroy it. Let me give you an example. In May of 2013, a Vietnamese app developer named Dong Nguyen developed this game called Flappy Birds. Some of you may have downloaded it once upon a time. For eight months, critics said that it was far too complicated, it was not a good game, and it reminded them of too much of Nintendo Super Mario Brothers. Right? So for eight months, it was hitting the bottom of the download charts. But in January of 2014, it quickly rose to the very top, having thousands of downloads over and over. And at its peak, every single day, the app developer was making $50,000 in ad revenues alone. This should have been the gold mine for app developers. Some of you are thinking, how do I create a game like that? <laughs> right? In just one month, though, this is what happened. People started to write into the reviews. And people started saying, it ruined my life. Its side effects are worse than cocaine and meth. Maybe a little hyperbolic, but that's what they said. Second person, the apocalypse. My life is over as they're playing the game, right? Let me start by saying, do not download Flappy Bird. People warn me. I don't care. I don't sleep. I don't eat. I'm losing friends. Y'all laugh because that might have been you, right? <laughs> like, that might have been us. And in one month of January 2014, after one month of his success, this is what the developer said on Twitter. I'm sorry, Flappy Bird users. 22 hours from now, I will take down Flappy Bird. I cannot take this any longer. In his book, Irresistible, Adam Alter, a marketing professor at New York University, details behavioral addiction. And using Chuck Colsterman's metaphor, he says, emails are like zombies. You keep killing them, and they keep coming back. <laughs> so true, right? And this is what the research shows. People spend a quarter of their days checking their emails. Okay? And every single hour, we check our emails 36 times on average. And in one study, Somebody showed that people felt, half of the participants said that they felt like they were losing a lack of control because of emails. That's how they associated it. So what do video games and emails have in common? They can be endlessly addicting if we don't pay attention to it. And I think we can all agree, technology can be quite chaotic. We try to keep up with everyone's Instagram feeds, and we try to keep up with emails and calendar invites and Slack messages. I wonder if we're losing our ability to create and be creative because we're stuck in this technology chaos. As an organizational consultant and workshop facilitator, I have an opportunity to work with groups all around the world. Um, and I love being able to watch people interact and to create meaningful experiences for people to have crucial conversations. It's an incredible thing that I get to do. And for the past year, I've been doing these micro experiments. I know, I'm just kind of sick, right? I do these micro experiments, and, 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 and uh, specifically on smartphone distraction. 
Okay? And so let me give you an example. One group I went into, I had a six-month work with them, and I asked them every single time I came into the workshop, I asked them if they would put their phones away in the box, much like I had you put your phones away underneath your chair. People came to me, and they were like, ah, this is the worst, right? Maybe how you might have felt. So I had them put their phones in a box similar to this. One time I asked them, what's one app that you would delete to increase your focus? And this is what they said. This is one of the most <laughs> Instagram, Gmail. Isn't it ironic that the very thing that helps us work and connect with people is the very thing that distracts us from focus, right? It's quite ironic. Then I asked another question. I said, what's one word to describe how you feel putting your phone away, okay? 21% said neutral. 36% said positive, and 42% said negative. People who said things were negative were things like, I feel like I'm being babied, or I feel a loss of control. Other people that said positive said freedom, focus, boundaries. Interesting, right? This was just for 90 minutes. Then at the end of, so we have a mixed bag of results, right? Kind of neutral, positive, negative, not, not, that, not that big of a deal. But then I asked this question at the very end of 90 minutes. I said, on a scale from one to nine, one being really negative and nine being very positive, what's the impact of not having your phone during this workshop for your focus? Was it a positive thing? 100% of people said either neutral or positive. Their focus was increased because they simply didn't have their phones in front of them. You see, there's two things that were of particular interest for me after this research. Number one, as the months went on, when people came to my workshops, they just stopped bringing their phones. They were like, I don't have to drop it in the box. I don't know if that means anything, but they stopped bringing their phones altogether. The second thing that was interesting for me was one time during the middle of my workshop, as I was teaching, somebody went in, grabbed his phone, did something on it, I'm not quite sure, put it back in, and sat down like nothing happened. I was like, what are you doing, bro? <laughs> like, there's a reason why it's in the box in the middle of the table, right? Interestingly enough, when we asked people to physically put their phones away, the allure and the temptation and the draw was just so strong that he couldn't help but reach for it. But you see, it's not his fault, and it's not our fault. Tristan Harris, former Google design ethicist and the founder of the Center of Humane Technology, says this, technology hijacks the way we perceive our choices and replaces them with new ones. Quite interesting, right? Another way of looking at it is that uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. So the more and more we reach for our phones, the more and more it becomes a habit, which can then become an addiction. And you see, app developers, they get commissioned to make their applications more and more addictive. It's quite ironic, right? Consider these few examples. Pinterest, harmless, harmless, right? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that the photos are asymmetrical on there? Developers know that if you see parts of an image, you can't help but keep scrolling up. Right? Interesting. Interesting. So if you see parts of images, you're going to want to continue to scroll up. Or consider this example, Netflix. You might not be able to see the bottom, but Netflix has mastered the art of unintentional choice. Instead of giving you the choice of whether to stop and maybe go for a walk or have dinner with your friends and family, or <laughs> maybe get some work done. It's give you, it gives you a little timer that says three, two, one, and then you have to watch the next episode. <laughs> this screenshot said eight seconds. I think it's down to three, right? It just goes faster and faster. And then finally, Amazon. Have you ever noticed that after you've been searching for a while, it says, have you considered trying buying these items? <laughs> Chance? Not so much, right? The algorithms have been so designed to be able to know what other items you might bundle because they know if you continue to research and spend more time on their website, the chances are you're going to spend more money. So this is where we are. We live in a world where we're bombarded by technology. And for the remainder of my time, I wanted to provide a few practical steps to managing the technology vortex we find ourselves in. I've labeled these as OS updates, operating updates, because I believe they embody the internal updates that we must make in order to evolve with technology. First step, 
OS update number one, be mindful of your technology use. Last year, I wanted to become more conscious of my smartphone use, so I decided to download an app called Moment. Moment is an app that tracks all your screen time, knows all the um, applications that you use, and this was actually my screen video of my phone. I spent over three hours a day, and unfortunately, Instagram was the highest, uh, was the most used application on my phone. Just two weeks ago, this is two weeks ago, guys, Apple announced in their new iOS update, iOS 12, screen time. 2012, 2018, iOS number 12. This is the first time that they've released anything like this called screen time. What it does is it shows you notifications. You could put limits on your phone. I know it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it is a big deal. Because when you begin to see how many hours you spend on your phone, you might be thinking to yourself, I wonder if this is getting in the way of my creativity, not enhancing it, right? I would encourage you to use the built-in features and use it as a tool. And consider a couple questions. Ask yourself, do I really need this app? Is it helping or hindering my productivity? And does this help app make me feel better about myself or worse? In this way, we can become more aware of our smartphone use. Another useful tip I think is helpful is go analog. A few months ago, I asked my friend who's a composer for Disney, and I said, hey, tell me some of your top productivity hacks. And he says, I use something called the time cube. A time cube is a little physical element that you can put on your desk and you can move over and it sets a timer. And this comes out of the Pomodoro technique where we take segmented times of work and we have deep work as a result of that. I found that if I put my alarm on my phone, I get tempted by it. I look at all the notifications that pop up and then you're like, how did I get to Instagram? It's just a habit, <laughs> right? I know, this is for work, I promise, it's good, it's good. <laughs> OS update number two, be mindful of physical space. Let me give you an example. Pretend like you're trying to lose a few pounds, okay? Does it make sense for you to have a box of donuts sitting at your desk every single day? Not so much, thank you Creative Mornings for helping us curb that addiction. <laughs> Here's the thing, psychologists call this behavioral architecture. If your phone is causing you to be more distracted, does it make sense for you to have your phone on your desk? Not so much. Consider turning it off, putting on airplane mode, throwing it in your purse or your bag, or leaving it in a different room altogether. If you want to take it to the next step, I would encourage you, before you go have dinner or a beer with a couple friends, consider leaving your phone in your car the entire time. And ask yourself, how do I feel right now? Does it feel awkward to me? Or is it allowing me to engage with people right in front of me more intentionally? In a recent study published by Google, Julia Aranda and Sophia Bag, they talk about two different kinds of struggles that technology has on us. Number one, it's this, internal struggle. We just can't seem to self-regulate and put our phones down. That's just the world we live in right now. Everything is connected to us. The second kind of struggle was external obligations to respond to people quickly. Some of you might even be sitting here right now thinking, I wonder if my boss just texted me and Danny asked me to put my phone away, right? Just blame it on me, I promise, it's okay. Right, or we're thinking to ourselves, I wonder if something's wrong or why, hasn't they texted, why haven't they texted back? Or think about from the other side of things, when people are out there texting you, they might be thinking, is everything okay? There's these external obligations that we face. And interestingly enough, this research was titled toward Joma, Jomo, the joy of missing out and the freedom of disconnecting. Now, I'm gonna explain what Jomo is in just a moment, but I want to introduce you to my last and final point, and this is the most important point this morning. If there's anything you walk away with, it's this. OS update number three, practice Jomo. In a New York Times article by Haley Phelan titled, How to Make This the Summer of Missing Out, this is how she defines Jomo. She says, Jomo is not a misspelling of mojo, <laughs> but rather stands for the joy of missing out, the antithesis of FOMO, or the fear of missing out. <laughs> Jomo is about disconnecting, opting out, and being okay just where you are. Jomo is about finding balance. So I wonder if it's not a technology problem, but it's a human problem. And to be honest, 
sometimes difficult to be where we are, isn't it? Our career status, our creativity, just where we are at work and life, our social status. It's difficult sometimes just to be merely present. And the flip side of it is, sometimes it's difficult to be around other people, isn't it? The fear of rejection, being judged, not knowing what your relationship is like with that other person. It's difficult. And I wonder if it's fear that's keeping us from authentically connecting with ourselves, our work, and our world right around us. You see, technology gives us this illusion that we can be everywhere and do anything when in reality, we're nowhere and can't get anything done. Let me end with this one last final illustration. In a recent film titled Ready Player One, James Halliday is a creator of this virtual, virtual reality existence called Oasis. Oasis is a place where you can be whoever you want to be. And you go and you place your life, your entire commerce, entire business, entire education is on this platform. And it's quite ironic, but listen to what James Halliday, the inventor of Oasis, says about his creation. He says, I created the Oasis because I never felt at home in the real world. I didn't know how to connect with the people right there. I was afraid for all of my life right up until I knew it was ending. That was when I realized, as terrifying and painful as reality can be, it's the only place where you can find true happiness because reality is real. I wonder if we're missing real opportunities to connect because we've caved into our digitally crazed world that we find ourselves in. Imagine what kind of creativity you and I could bring to San Diego and our world if we choose to intentionally connect with ourselves, our work, and the people right in front of us. I think we would be able to harness the power of technology without sacrificing our humanity. So, as a way of experiencing JOMO, I'm going to ask you to be vulnerable with me one last time. Is that okay? You guys with me? I'm going to have you in just a moment stand silently. Okay, in a room this big, it can get quite chaotic. chaotic. Chaos. I'm going to have you stand, and I'm going to have you find a partner you did not come with. Okay? So go ahead and stand, and find a partner silently that you did not come with. Just meet eye to eye. Okay. Real quick. All right. Chaos. Hold on one sec. Hold on one sec. All right. You found a partner? Everyone found a partner? Okay. I want you to silently look at your partner. I want you to silently look at your partner. Okay? I want you to examine what color their eyes are without talking. Now, I want you to notice their smile. <laughs> now, I want you to ask yourself, I wonder what this person is here for. I wonder what their dreams and aspirations are. I wonder what excites them. Okay, now, as you're staring at somebody else, <laughs> I want you to say three simple phrases, and I'll give it to you one at a time. First one, I see you. I'm glad you're here. You are a creative. Thank you very much. My name is Danny Kim. It's been a pleasure talking. <laughs>